thank you very much for all for being here. Uh, I've been kindly invited by Circa to give you uh, a talk. I'm not sure it's very relevant to you, but you tell me later. Um, so I will take about 40 minutes to, pray, to introduce uh, the project, and uh, after we'll have a question and answer sessions. Uh, so, I'm living in Paris, and as Kim said, that I was a filmmaker, etc. And um, I can, I, as everybody else on the planet, we started to notice some drawing uh, uh, sign of global problems. But it's not only Paris, it's also Beijing, much worse, in Moscow, and Canada, and almost everywhere else. Uh, we're losing a lot of resources, and uh, the, the entire um, environment is changing at the moment. We uh, accumulate a lot of waste, and uh, in a poor country as well as a very rich country. Uh, we have a problem, as you probably know, uh, it's called uh, climate change, and uh, we will argue here that it's not um, a decision only, but it's an uh, emergence of what we call now a complex system. So I don't know if you're familiar with complex systems, but complex systems come is pretty new concept in science uh, that has been explored not, uh, by, for example, the uh, SAPAF Institute that gather a lot of scientists from all over the world and from all different fields. Uh, complex systems have come from a pretty new uh, discovery from the 20th century that uh, uh, the world is not a mathematical uh, world that not everything is uh, computable and actually science seems to be pretty inefficient in that kind of world. So what we did been discovered at the beginning of the 20th century is something that we call the, the chaos. Uh, uh, the chaos. So we discovered that until the 1930s about we were about sure that the world were, was computable that anything could be explained by science, science anticipated and uh, uh, planned ahead. But the mathematics itself proved that actually uh, there's something that's called the chaos, that's, uh, we, by changing a little bit of uh, data, we end up with a very, very different results. So we are uh, not in a linear world, that we, uh, uh, that we say. Uh, that's a lot, a lot of implications, and these implications are uh, that basically the world is unpredictable, uh, but not totally complete, uh, completely unpredictable because it's a chaotic, but it's organized chaos. So we only start to understand what it means, and it's very complicated, and it seems that it didn't reach yet our uh, um, normal cycle. The society we live in. One of the first things we've been doing, studying the complex uh, and, and the system and the chaos world, is what we call aut uh, automaton. And it's a very interesting thing that we take, for example, grid of uh, simple grid and we change rules, we give rules to very simple rules, and then it generates uh, effects. For example, we said the, the white square next to a black square we, we produce two white square on the, on the other side so very simple mathematic rules and by generating these rules row after row it appears that we have some emergence that we call so figures that is, are absolutely unpredictable so by changing the rules at the element level we have emergence that's absolutely unpredictable we have to go through each line of development to find out what kind of figure we're going to have. That goes to fractal uh, geometry that we know that with a very simple rule or so, by multiplying these rules, we start to have figures which are extremely complex. Interestingly, when we come back to this automaton, we, we put rules for each cell, but all will not survive. Certain rules will end up as a very boring things or will disappear, the, 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 the board will 
you can completely black or completely white or very repetitive. And we find that in nature also. Every natural system develop on the system and a lot of trials and error, a lot of trials are done. And we end up with a kind of uh, a certain typology that we call patterns that we can find in a lot of different systems, living systems. So here you will see a few patterns that are very coherent and at very different scale. So that's a fern, that's a cabbage, and we can see that those things are repetitive and correspond to patterns. So what's another? Uh, so so we discovered that complex systems have uh, qualities and properties. And a complex system, one of the complex system properties is that it's composed with a lot of elements, like the automatons, which play the same rules. And from these same rules, it emerge qualities which are not controlled by any of the elements of the of the ensemble. For example, a school of fish. None of the fish is aware of the movement of the of the school. But it happens that the uh, school of fish starts to have uh, biological behavior smarter than the predator. So uh, <clears throat> another quality of the uh, complex systems is they are extremely resilient. So if you take hundreds of the elements out of the system, it's still working the same way. So how does it work? We have also to understand that complex system is not a complicated system. There's a difference between complicated and complex system. A compli complicated system, for example a mechanic, you remove one element and it stops working. So every element are interdependent but dependent, uh, extremely fragile. In fact, a complicated machine is fragile, a complex one is very resilient. When it comes to the universe, uh, the Greek, but essentially the Renaissance, the, from the 15th century, the, the birth of science, we discovered that there was geometry and mathematics, and we started to believe that the entire universe was a machine. Something that was very rational, that can be predicted, cal calculated, etc. And we start to envision the world as a machine and a clock that was the first uh, machine we built which were efficient and looking like life, the clocks, the automatons, and we start to rationalize the world. So the, we start to have this view of the world that it was very rational and very predictable. And we started to design cities like clocks on the same model. So that's the first city plans of in, in the 15th century, which was a kind of uh, cultural shift, a very important cultural shift. And slowly, slowly, we start to build machines that are working, but which are more and more complicated, but still fragile. If you remove one tube of these machines, it's probable that it, it, it will stop to work. We build cities also on the same model. I'm an architect. And uh, uh, I know how to, uh, city planners work, and they work on the city like on the machine. Of course, the machine works. Huh? We can send, we can make a watch, we can uh, send people on the moon. At local scale, uh, rationality works. But what is interesting, it's at a certain point, it's still working. We have an idea of it by science, the, the, the art of science is removing what is uh, complicated in fact. What we cannot, so all about science is about simplifying the world to make it predictable. Unfortunately this world has its own life and what we call a city here, here we call it a city on the right side, on the left side we call that squatter areas. It's not a city according to the urbanist. But these things has a life by itself. And that's what it is interesting. It's, it seems that every living system are complete, uh, complex systems. They have their own rules and they create complexity. 
it's what we call uh, uh, it's it's uh, it goes against the thermal it seems to go against the thermodynamic law that tend to unify everything in that we create complexity. It means things are more and more complicated. If you take a cell, a cell, then it aggregates to make a, 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 a living entities, uh, multicellular uh, entities, and then we aggregate until we make human beings, living, living uh, mammals, and the mammals are living in society, and we create complexity, which are layers of elaborations. It seems cities, it's not seems, it's a fact that cities are actually only the compressions of human relationships. So it's like a shell that we're growing, and we're growing cities like living systems. But nowadays still, that's a plan of the best architects of the time, 21st century, Norman Foster, and it doesn't draw uh, cities like watch anymore, but it draws cities like a uh, motherboard of computer. Uh, so the, 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 the idea, the persistence of rationality is still very, very pregnant on our cultural uh, society. And we, try, we tend to solve problems with a lot of engineering, and sometimes with very simple, uh, for very simple problems. Transportation, you know in Manila it's a good example, is one of the uh, things we solve the worst. From going to point A to point B, we develop a lot of infrastructures with a lot of money, with a lot of energy consumed to move around, so build up, and we end up with that. So we start to have complicated system then also to uh, to solve the problem that it creates itself with other systems that you know it's a it's a it's a I don't know how to say in English, but. Uh, an accumulation of uh, solutions on problems created by the same, uh, the same uh, systems. We're very much in love with car. It's a French car, by the way. Uh, uh, <clears throat> and that never happens. The, the, the thing is also we are in a system nowadays that promote uh, mm, a, a tendency which are more and more remote from reality. Uh, we tend to lie for us, uh, to ourselves to, to keep the system working. So the system obviously creates a lot of problems, but we start as individuals to lie to ourselves and end up pretty happy. So between that and that, we promise ourselves that and we get that. Interestingly, so economy is a complex system also, but it works on figures and provisions and mathematically, but in fact, it's a complex system, and a complex system, as we said at the beginning, is like automatons. We choose rules. So individuals within a society choose a set of rules, and all these individuals in this society need the same rules to function together, to 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 come in in uh, enter uh, actions, and those rules in the economy, are, for example, in that kind of world, is to make a profit. Nobody works in our society without making a profit. To maximize the profit, as soon as you are able to make a profit, you want to maximize the profit, and you want to be the best. That's a three basic rule within a society that almost here everybody agrees to, and in the society, we, to, function, to be functional in our society, we have to follow those rules. But those rules make us a complex system with emergencies that we don't control. So nobody actually can predict the outcome, like the automaton. We will have to go through all the layers to see what the rules we choose at the beginning will end up as an emergence. And we are in the middle of it. One of the things, so and we, uh, this kind of complex system also uh, create um, patterns. And it's obvious that the patterns we, we create here are pyramidal patterns. If you want to be the, the, the best and there's a competition, somebody ends up at the top and a lot of layers of losers are accumulating in and on the side. If you make a profit, so you pull the resources at the top and you deplete uh, the bottom. And that's what we happen, that happens. It's, that's a very simple figure that you can understand emerging from these three rules. And that's a, the rules 
that we have here. So the very top 0.1 person we cannot see, unfortunately, what's here from them. But it's one person, a 0.1 uh, person uh, accumulate the big resources of the, the, the society. And that's the Philippines, but actually it's very good figure of the world. It means more than 74, almost 75 percent of the people live with very low resources when the 25 percent uh, monopolize almost things. So that's an emergence that happens not because there's bad uh, people deciding to do so, it's just an emergence of the rule we choose. Making a profit, maximizing the profit, and being the best. And of course, living in that kind of system, we project ourselves in that kind of things. Believing that there's some people at the top who are things. But in fact, we are rather ending in the middle class, rather than like that, with a kind of delusion about what's going on really. Very few of us will end up at the top. And we get all frustrated at the point. So at the individual side, when the system is dying, it means this, this, the elements are not uh, sustained anymore. And that's what I argue is happening at the moment. All the system, as you remember, in automaton will not make it according to the rule they make. We end up in a boring society or a successful society, a, a, a vibrant one. Another thing is very important that the actual economy doesn't understand is that by having a, a, a gross rate, what we call you know, 3%, 6%, Philippines at the moment is at 6.5% gross, there's a very simple mathematic rule that when you have a gross, it means you're an exponential, uh, uh, you're on an exponential uh, curve. Because when you have an exponential well, uh, gross percentage, it means that at a certain time, you double everything. You double your output, but you double also your, uh, your, your consumptions, whatever. So every time you double, it's an exponential curve. What we don't understand in an exponential curve as human, we have a very little understanding of that, it, it goes very, very, very fast at the point. It starts very slowly, but at the point it goes very fast. And we believe now, studying the things, that we are really on the last legs of this exponential curve. I can answer more about that on a later, so let's move on. So, and now we are on exponential curve also on global warming. It means we're reaching, really, the limits of our capacity of sustaining ourselves. We end up with a very uh, numerical, uh, quantitative society. So we, we count on things for uh, quantities. We produce a lot of things and we, co uh, we, we consume a lot of things. That's a quantitative society and we value quantities. We want a lot of money. We don't Good money, we want a lot of money, we want a lot of stuff. But the problem is that we end up generally in that kind of futures, and we need to sustain our growth to produce a lot more and more things, including animals. So it brings us to some kind of system which are, believe, are extremely dangerous. I mean, if you study it, it be that, uh, for a lot of reasons, health reasons, for sanitary reason is very dangerous. We also need to push the field where you are, agriculture, to produce more and more. So to industrialize our productions, uh, the, the careful, that's in the state, but soon it will be here, uh, producing meat becomes uh, uh, an industry where those cows will never see one blade of grass in their life. And that is what it produces, it means a gigantic pool of extremely toxic waste. And that has a cost also, of course, we don't only overproduce things, we also deplete our things. So, uh, 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 exponential curves mean in mathematics that it goes very fast, but in the physical uh, world where we live, really, uh, an exponential uh, curve means there's a next explosion at the point, where there's an explosion suddenly of things and there's an implosion of resources and that's what happening at the moment at very large scale so we're losing soil by agriculture we're losing about 15 million hectares a year 
and we uh, uh, concrete them about 5 million hectares a year. We don't see it, so to produce food that's measured, but we don't see it because in the same time while losing soil, we cut forests to plant, and we can cut in about the same amount, between 13 and 15 million uh, hectares of forest every year, which has consequences. Uh, because, uh, as you know, air is produced by uh, trees, but not only air, the soil is produced by trees, and the pump uh, of uh, the, I mean, the, the circling of water through the trees is embedded. We know that what happened in the watershed, watershed is a major uh, thing happening, and when we cut the tree, we have a big impact on the water, on, on the water management. Sometimes it goes big, sometimes it disappears. And of course, all these cycle, ac accelerate uh, cycle of uh, climate effect also. We accumulate waste to the point that, I mean, you know those, those pictures, it's absolutely staggering. And not just the beginning, that's 20th century, uh, 19th century didn't show that, right? Uh, 21st and 22nd century will be much more uh, clogged by by by, uh, by waste because we are on an exponential uh, thing. So let's say you have a seven person growth at the moment. So the the capture the, the the computation is very easy. You take the number 70 and you divide it by the, uh, the growth rate and you have the number of year that you could take to double. So if you have a growth of seven person every 10 years you double the output and you double the waste and you double the consumption all right that's a very simple mathematics so 10 years from the time the photo has been taken there will be twice the waste in the water and two years, 20 years later it will be four times eight times 16 times and it goes very fast we're destroying also uh, the planet at the same rate and Energy-wise, you know that we start to be depleted to the point that the Canadians are getting oil from star sand and destroy trade in, in the process. Fast swell of land, and that's forever. This land will never come back. There was a boreal forest here. So now we have to ask ourselves: What do we want to leave to our kids? What do we uh, let them? This dirty water, this uh, polluted things. The wave is coming. There's no question about it. The, it's, it's not if it's coming or not, it's when it's coming. And the time we have before it hit us, this huge wave, we have to learn to deal with it. So either we're going to be submerged by it, and your generation has very good chance, I'm sorry to say so, to be submerged by this wave, or we're going to need to learn how to surf on it. And it's possible. That's why we call that hyper-adaptation. We don't just want to adapt to it, we just don't want to float on these waves or to, to survive this wave. We want to learn how to surf on this wave. And that is, is not so difficult, but is, is uh, a request decisive action. So how do we operate in that kind of complex system where obviously there's no central power? I mean, politicians are uh, pretending they can do things, in fact they cannot, because the system is that for them, it's not done decided for the system. Nobody decided to have these uh, slums building around the city. That's Caracas and Venezuela. That's Mexico. But there's interesting things. When you start to observe that, you can notice some patterns. Okay, that's IT where I started to prepare my picture. Place I know very well. That's corals. And you start to see patterns, right? That's the stars. And that's London. That's your brain, your cells, your neurons, that's Moscow, and that's internet. That's also a connection on the internet. That's a flower. So how do we operate it? It seems in actually we do operate, since ever we do operate in, in complex system. But we, we lost uh, the way to do so. That's uh, existing church, huh? it's in England. And it's a, a Gothic uh, architecture, much before we have any technology to compute all that or to, to, to build that. 
So we are operating in complex system, and at the point we are very able to, to operate in complex system. And that's what we produce today with the normal economy. I think we lost our track and our... So it's a matter of design. We have a design problem. Uh, that's Dubai, uh, uh, where they spent a lot, billions of dollars to, to, to mimic poorly nature in a desert. Huge uh, amount of, of energy being spent for something which is absolutely not sustainable. And that's a dead by Russia, where nobody invests anything, and which is an extremely productive uh, system uh, that works by itself. No input. But it works to sustain life, it could sustain it. So it's where permaculture uh, comes, it's where I discovered. So relying on technology or relying on natural system. Permaculture relies on natural system, but we intend to make life as good as an environmental society. By starting to observe forest. So permaculture started by observing forest and observing that for thousands of years, uh, forests grow and keep growing and produce uh, things adapted to a lot of different species without any input, uh, without any real work, etc. And it's possible. We belong to this world. In fact, we have to realize we are part of this world, the natural world. And if you look from far, we can see patterns in what we used to do. Not a, a seaweed a farm in Thailand that sells of uh, vegetables, probably. That's uh, leaves, and we see we can see patterns how the way the things are done in natural world and how we use to do things, and it's very coherent. And it's coherent at different scale. That's what it's missing. So here we cannot say if it's a, a landscape of the surface of the rock. So, it's what we call a fractal geometry. So what happened at very small scale, happened at very large scale. That's the first indication of how should we operate. If we operate at a very short, small scale, it means our scale, uh, with the right elements, we have a very good chance to have a ripple effect that at a very large scale will work also. So, the economic society we saw we work with three rules, right? That makes the elements coherent among themselves in the economy, uh, make a profit, maximize the profit, and be the best. That's a rule that our society on, on a large scale agree with. The interest of permaculture is proposed another set of rules. Be care for the earth, care for the people, take what you need and leave the rest. So it happens that I adopt these rules, and by just adopting at my level these rules, and of course acting accordingly to it, I, I, I get myself in contact with people who have the same rules. And that happens de facto. I don't have to look for them, just by doing the same things according to this rule, de facto I get uh, associated with people who have the same rules. And then we start to work as a network, we start to work as a complex system, and we start to have emergencies. It's actually why I'm talking to you right now, is because this system made me encounter other people, learning other things, and having some actions that makes me interesting enough to come to talk to you today. Uh, it's not a plan that I didn't plan to come to talk to you, but it's an emergence of what I'm doing. right? So by just changing my rule at a very basic uh, level, Stage changes. So how do we operate? It's, it's still in a complex system very difficult to to uh, to plan in things because we are uh, again in a very unpredictable world. So we cannot plan it, plan it in fact. We cannot theorize it in fact. So, but we have tools like strategy. Strategy. There's a very famous philosopher who talked about it. It's the art of uh, uh, operating in in an unknown world. It comes from military. Military has objective, but they don't. They cannot plan because the terrain is moving a lot. So the terrain is di dictating your choice. And two, 
progress in that, in that way, you need to be on the terrain because that's a terrain that will give you the, uh, the actions uh, that will have, you will have to uh, follow. So we choose a terrain, and that's the Udalo River. Uh, it's a uh, watershed located in Abradeilog, which is in uh, Mindoro, Occidental, north of Mindoro, on the very island passage. Very important passage because there it's one of the hot spots of uh, marine biology in the world. Very important spot. So that's the watershed we have, with actually uh, five watershed uh, of different size. But that's uh, the ensemble that we decided to operate in. And we started this project with a theoretical approach. So we decided to act as a group because when I started to choose my uh, way for permaculture principle and action, I, I, we end up with groups, with people who have the same values and same uh, functioning. And so we designed things together. And we have an emergence, we are most, we're smarter together than individual by uh, uh, alone. So we started to uh, decide of a plan, which was basic, I'm going to explain you now. It's a, uh, so we wanted to start by uh, working in the sea, because there's a real emergency. It's one of the last very uh, savage, uh, untamed space in the sea. So we, we, did, we bet that it's, uh, it's, it will bounce faster. It's, we have the best chance to restore a system which is not tampered with. And C is dying at a very fast pace, but it might bounce very fast. So we wanted to back up our work on the C. It's an urgent, emergency planet-wise. Huh? And we decided to come in the Philippines because you have an archipelago, and it's, uh, you have extremely big biodiversity. Fish is still very important in your diet, 70% of the protein of the populations here, I think, and uh, you have largely unsustainable fishing practices. So that can be reformed. So we associate with a uh, university uh, teacher who's been working with us, my biologist, and who had some track record in Mexico, Chile, and Malaysia, and started to design that around a uh, marine protected area. The other thing is also we wanted to demonstrate that sustainable development is an economy. So economy is a problem at the moment, the way it's designed, but we, as a as human species, we need to work with economy, so we need to reinvent this economy from the field. It's not a theoretical, it will not happen in a book or in classroom, it will happen on the field. So we want to make a, a demonstration there. It needs to be an international project. Uh, because uh, in Philippines, as you probably know, you have a management problem, highest level, and it needs to be uh, monitored by different countries, and also have the support of uh, expertise of uh, different countries. And we uh, set values for these projects, is that first we want to have an environmental impact, a cultural impact, and then a commercial impact. So that's in order. So we want first to restore the environment, then to harmonize the societies, and then make a profit on the, on the return on investment. We want to have it as a holistic approach because uh, we believe that working in silos is inefficient. Uh, we need to talk laterally with other science and other uh, domains. And we want to uh, work with the communities because nothing will happen on the ground uh, if we don't engage at, at the first uh, line, the communities. I'll explain how we do later. We want to have a model self cooperative management and international investment. We work on connectivity from land to sea and including small scale mining, which is, we will have to deal with, uh, coastal and uh, land and uh, marine protected area. So we designed the project to happen in three phases. We are in the middle of the first phase development. Feasibility study, which is a lot of science and, and, uh, and uh, inquiry on the, on the ground. Phase two implementation. Hopefully it will happen in six months. We start to we start already to work on the ground, but 
we don't implement solution yet because the solution will have to be implemented with the local populations. And then the third uh, phase will be the scaling up and how do we uh, scale up the project. It happens that you have 1,000 uh, NPA at the moment and there's no regulation on this, this NPA. If we can set up a standard of working at if, uh, in an efficient way, we might uh, scale up to the 1,000 and have a real tax revenue. Using, of course, our uh, also barefoot ecologists who will be able to move uh, on. So we've been on the field for a bit more than one year. <coughs> we, at the first, we were one association. Then it blast Because things happen and uh, uh, we fail, in a way, uh, as a group. But failure is part of the, uh, the growth. We need to fail early and a lot to be able to progress. And that's the, the, the a need also in complex system is how the, the, uh, the living system works. You make trials, it, it fails, and, and, you, and you grow up. So now we have five organizations, so it's a good thing. And I will detail how we operate on the field. So Echo Square is uh, the, the, the association that is in charge of the economical side and management of things. So it will finance, find finance for the other things and we, we, we bet that uh, the economy and the ecology are two things that can reinforce each other. And the proof was in 2013, actually there was the first uh, forum in Hong Kong about climate change from big investors. There was 11 trillion dollars of investment potential from four uh, continents. And there was a lot of money, a lot of company, big banks, uh, uh, investment funds and, and pension funds who wanted to invest in sustainable economy. And what we discovered is that this big money is available <coughs> But the project on the ground are much too small to pretend to be investment. So in between people working on the ground, developing solutions, and people who want to give the money for it, there's a gap, and there's no connections between the two. So that's what EcoSquare is working on, is to set up possibilities of real investment in the sustainable uh, development at large scale. It's why we choose to work on territorial level, on watershed. It has to be significant on scale and uh, also significant on the uh, ecological uh, point of view. And the watershed, according to us, is a minimum uh, environmental unity to understand what's going on. If you work only on the mar uh, marine protected area, it doesn't work. If you work only on, on the agriculture, it doesn't work. If you work only on forestry, it doesn't work. You have to work on a comprehensive interaction because it is a complex system. So a small variation at the reef, uh, at, the, at, the, at the reach of the um, of your watershed, will have drastic consequence on the uh, marine protected area. So we created this association that's uh, called Ripple Watch, with several scientists working in it, from uh, uh, pilot, I mean, forestry to, to marine biology, and we started to study the, the places. So that's the upper side of our Udalo watershed. Where the trees are not too much cut, but if you see on very often in Philippines, the top mountains have been, uh, are bald. And that's a major problem because trees don't go up the, the slope. So it will take a long time before it's able to, to, uh, to repopulate the, the, the summit of these mountains. But in our area, it's still not so bad. There's people living there. Very interesting people called the Mangyans, those, uh, there's uh, Ir Iraya uh, Mangyans, and they've been living there and they've been doing something very interesting that they adapted uh, their environment to the growth of their population in a very smart way. For 30 years they've been cultivating rice, organic rice, in the middle of the mountains. And they're very successful, they, they don't have a way of uh, in, 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 in trend. They don't have disease, they don't lose uh, fertility of the soil. But everything is not pink. We have some problems still. 
And in 2000, uh, 2016, we had a massive uh, landslide here uh, at the top of the watershed, just when we started the project. We started the project January uh, 16, and that's December, so December 15, uh, 2015, there was this massive landslide. And we have another problem here, that is a road being built. And those two things happening in our watershed has uh, drastic consequences. Uh, that's, so that's the village I told you here. There's a village, you can see the fields here of uh, the Mangan village. It's called Latag. And that's a photo that's uh, aerial image that's date from 2013. And that's just after, it's in uh, 2016, beginning of 2016, and you see the change of the river course. And here, you see there's a new branch of the river, and I went there just uh, passing my 40 minutes. Sorry. Uh, um, well, it, it, by chance nobody died here, but that was a drastic scene from the, 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 the ground. That was drastic. There's a huge erosions that happened in this river, and this erosion changed the course of the river. So it triggers some some mechanism that now is uh, it destroyed the soils. Of the, the bridge also, because more the water is charged, as you probably know, that's more destructive the power of the river becomes. And we uh, dive since then, we did some uh, baseline of the, the, the marine uh, protected area, and we have a major situation that is killing the, 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 the power of the river. That's the uh, Idalo River when it doesn't rain, and that's the Idalo River when it rains. You see a lot of situations coming out. Plus the road, which is absolutely badly conceived and, and, and done and which is uh, interesting uh, and, uh, so that's aggravating of course the, 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 the situation of things plus traditional uh, kind of, but that's not kind of really actually we had we a student doing a master two with us in, in that thing and he did a remarkable uh, work from satellites and from the ground, and it demonstrates that kind of uh, made by the Iraya people are not destroyed. Actually, they were maintaining the forest. Uh, but what happened, there's another mechanic that I'll describe later, maybe in a of time, where actually, no, it's not kind of they're doing, it's a charcoal of production. Under the, 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 pretense, the pretense of doing kind of, actually, it's charcoal production, but this Dynamic happened for social reasons because some uh, Tagalog people decided to raise uh, goats. The goats are eating the, 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 the field of the uh, Mangyans who are not confrontational, so they don't say anything, but now they need money to buy food and to get money, they do the easiest things at, that they can do, they do sharp work. Which means on the coast we have real uh, problems of uh, vegetation coverage, which is not the case at all. Last problem also that we, we discovered here is that uh, the, 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 we're losing in productivity in the lower fields, which are not organic, and uh, so it starts to have disease, start of with a loss of, of yield, and uh, that's a problem. So that's a lower field. So we decided to work with the people. Uh, 15th century people were conceived like you know a perfect being, etc., uh, son of God. We believe that it's also the problem. Actually, if we uh, suppress the humans on the planet, things are okay. The problem is us. But as we say in permaculture, problems are the solutions. So we decided to work with the people, and for that, we're working uh, with the tool that I, I use, it's documentary fields. So, with documentary fields, we're going to work with the people and, and film the people with the people for the people. So, I'm not shooting anymore for uh, big. Uh, TV station, etc. I'm making films about the people with the people, and that has an effect because in science, when you observe something, the observation change the, the, the things that you observe, and that I've been experimenting a lot during my career. That's in uh, in uh, Mindanao, where it's much more dangerous than Mindoro, and I was filming about mines. And actually, the fact that I started to to film about the miners, small scale miner, changed the behavior of the, the miners in a very interesting way. So now I'm using 
this acting witness as, a, as a, an element to work should not be like that. To, to work with those uh, those people who are actually remarkable people, absolutely remarkable people. I'm really looking up to them. We went up recently with uh, actually scientists from UPLD, uh, specialists of work, ornithologues, and we went. We were stuck one night in that time. And uh, this ornithologue had uh, a telephone with with uh, uh, birds. He's training himself. He's a very good ornithologue. He can recognize birds uh, just walking in the two hours. But he was training himself to recognize birds with sounds. So he had an app on his phone uh, with all all the birds of the sound of the birds of the Philippines. And since in that time there's no electricity, no connection, nothing, so we were there. And just for fun, because I was with those friends. I said, okay, let's try your apps with those guys to see what the percentage of birds they recognize. They recognize immediately, in a few seconds, 100% of the birds. They identify exactly the species uh, they are. Very precisely, they can describe them and we can check because we have also the photo of the birds. So 100% of the sounds on the phone were identified. And not only that, they described to this very knowledgeable uh, scientist five birds that the scientists are absolutely incapable to spot, to know what it is. So that's very interesting things that potentially there's five species or five endemic uh, kind of bird that we don't understand. And we don't understand if it's real bird leader or if it's mythical bird. So we're going to go back with also uh, anthropologists. But suddenly, and then following that, we have two hours of very high level discussions about ornithology. Really. And those guys were extremely prominent. So they have the knowledge that is at the moment a, uh, a wealth that is spoiled, which we discard, and which will be lost in the next generation if we don't take care of it. My role as permaculture designer is to spot new resources and, 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 and uh, exploit them, make them valuable. And that, the knowledge of these people is extremely valuable. And that brings us to the, this, this man here knows plants like nobody. He knows all the medicinal plant. Uh, <coughs> his, his father lived 100 years. He was uh, the, the medicine man of the village. And uh, this gentleman now is a one. And there's another person who introduced rice 30 years ago and works a system perfectly for 30 years without a glitch. But they allowed us to grow their population and not uh, lose anything on their environment. Something that we should learn. They are totally autonomous. Actually, they don't need money. We listed the things of, uh, they needed out to buy. It's about 12 things they need, you know, like uh, uh, marmites, uh, you know, uh, blades, uh, but very few things. And for that, they trade. That's where trade should come in. It's when you have needs, you have resources. Normally, your resources cover a big part of your needs. And only when you cannot cover a certain part, then you find a way to get your excess of productions to, to trade. It's where trade has a sense. But trade for trade doesn't make sense. When we go down, for example, these people who are living from fish are fish on a commercial way. And that's a problem. So that's the bottom of our watershed. They are very nice people also. They have a very good knowledge of their, their, their uh, environment. They know very well the fish, etc. But they're destroying and they know that they're destroying. They're just saying basically by doing, uh, by fishing with very uh, small nets that fish out all the biology of, the, of the, the, the reef. And that's a problem, so we need to discuss with these people also to, to, uh, to uh, change the habits. Okay, so there's about 35 boats, 35 families in, in this coast where we work that is destroying the entire biology of the of the reefs in front. So I plan with acting witness to insert myself in the in the, in this village uh, for 12 months and live with them and shoot with them and understand why the logic of it and why what can be found. The solution will not be found by me. The solution will be found by the, the fishermen. And that brings us sorry I'm a bit longer than the than plan. So that brings us also that I'm going to build a house and we decided to build a house also so, uh, because uh, shelter is very important. So we started to build my house to study, to study the, 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 
the local resources and how the things were done. And so we, we uh, study the spaces, we reproduce the spaces, and we study the materials. And interestingly, I believe that there's a lot of, I'm an architect, I'm, also, I'm, I'm, I'm trained as an architect. And uh, we discovered that there's a lot of possibilities, of potential with the local uh, technology and local needs. And if you look and, and work, so we started to work, so it's upside down. Um, it's on the side, the bottom is here. That's the, 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 the first uh, place we, we build on the place, inspiring from this thing. And I spent eight months living there. And if we look and we work a little bit, that's not my house, that's in Japan. But if you look, <laughs> then, <laughs> you were surprised. <laughs> um, but you can see that it's exactly the same uh, materials, but there's a little thing that changed is the attention that's, that's put on the things. That's a know how. The technology that is very uh, accessible, but that's the way we do things. And that's what Ash Habitat is all about. We think that by paying attention, we can reach a state of civilization, which I believe was one in the history of humanity, is the Japanese Edo period. Your Japanese Edo period, uh, from 16 uh, something to 18 something, was the peak of civilization in Japan. Because they had a, uh, a civilization that emphasizes quality and not quantities. So they were able to use things up to the really last resources. If you look at these bamboo fence, they use the thing that normally we discard. So it's at the very small branches of the bamboo up to the, 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 the leaves. Up. It's a way to pay attention to things. There's a word for that in Japanese, it's called wabi-sabi. And if you pay attention, you can do extraordinary things. It can lead really to a way to civilization that I believe is better than this one. That one is not a civilization, that is acculturation. But in the Philippines, it's what you've been sold to. So acculturation is very high, and I think we should go back to our roots to understand what we have. Poverty is not to have nothing. Poverty is to count what you don't have. So poverty starts by acculturation. As soon as you start to count what you have, you are rich. And that's what we propose to do. To pay attention to what you do, and do it very well. So that's, for example, an example of things. It's not the Philippines, but where people have been paying attention. We don't need to, to mimic Japan later, right? We can find our own way to do the things locally by just paying attention. So for that, for example, we can be creative on the kind of houses we, uh, we develop. And it can be very comfortable. That's not because it's bamboo that it has to be a shabby house and an unstable house. So we can have luxury, comfort, and develop structures that actually are very interesting on the, on, on the point of view of typhoon and, and earthquake. We can have really large houses. And by the way, that's bigger than houses. Uh, so people are buying that for very expensive things. There's about 5,000 bamboo on these things, and it's uh, a place, it's in Bali. So it's not Japanese, it's, it's, it's the Balinese have rediscovered a way to do their own architecture, it's local and craft. So they rediscover also a, a, techno, a technology that belongs to them, but they refine it in the design. And they create something which is absolutely, for me, actually, it's one of the best uh, architecture in the world. Extremely well adapted. Concrete has nothing to do in, in a tropical country. When we start to build in concrete, we need air pumps. It's a lot of waste of energy. Those houses that I visit uh, are very fresh. So that kind of things can happen anywhere, and I believe that is quality of life. So I advocate for quality of life rather than quantity of life. You pay attention, you do the things right, and if you do each of us do that, we start to adopt different values, we start to work as a, uh, as a complex system that can propagate ourselves. So if you look at the design, I mean, it's better than West, any Western design. More comfortable, smarter, technically very savvy, that's a bridge. 
But if you look here, that's we're back in Mindoro. That's Anuno Mangans. And if you look at, at the technology here, the knowledge of the, of the materials, to find the, 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 the right things to do the work, it's a suspended tree. Suspended tree has been invented in the West in the 19th century. Those guys have been doing that for thousands of years. So there's no how here. There's a lot of knowledge in, within the populations. And that's our last segment of, of, the, of the project, is education. So we have a, a text which is called Education Without War, and in French we say Ecole Oral Ormu. And I spend a few days, uh, 10 days with uh, those people in, totally immersed, and we started to do arts together, you know. And I just started to, to align stones, we don't see it very well, that's the article normally, but to do sculptures with them, and they were very interested to, to follow up. We do joints also, and I learned things. I learned this is this, is, this uh, friend, he's a very good friend of mine, who made me a knife in three days. And this person knows the environment like I've never seen. No scientist I know know the environment that like he knows. So what we plan to do, that's my knife, is to mix technology, high technology, with the knowledge of these people. That's another friend of mine he's living in, in Hong Kong, it's called Cesar Mada, and he's doing class online to children. He, he's an inventor, if you look at his name on, on the internet, he's pretty, pretty famous. He's a designer and invents things to, to uh, solve big problems. So when I met him, actually, he was going to Fukushima to measure the radioactivity of the uh, seabed, and I went within 15 days. We decided to go together in 15 minutes. And I, I followed it. And during this trip of 15 days in Japan, where we were uh, selling and, and, and gathering data for uh, the radioactivity, every Saturday or in the, in the uh, several times a week, actually, because he was giving classes to to his uh, the children in Hong Kong through internet. And he developed some projects, such as uh, uh, he was developing a project uh, also at the point to collect the plastic in the Pacific with drones that we can monitor with an app on the telephone from anywhere in the world through internet and, and collect a sample of the plastic that's floating in the Pacific to know the density, the quality and, and, and the nature of the plastic. And this project was, so it's a small drone, this project was led by uh, kids who were 9 years old. The chief of project was 9 years old. So he has all program to, uh, to educate through uh, webinar, etc. Through, through internet. Very interesting person. But I believe that if you have this kind of uh, uh, children in classroom, they're much more savvy than Hong Kong's kids. I mean, not because they're smarter, but it's because of the situation they live in. They live very close to nature, they are able to build bridge themselves at a very young age, and they're very uh, exposed, that makes them extremely uh, savvy. And I believe that if we bring them technology or science or whatever uh, tool of knowledge, we can send those kids to, how, to, to Oxford and Harvard in a few years. So that's a school at the moment that exists over there in uh, that time. And I believe it's torture to, to put kids uh, eight hours a day in a classroom like that uh, or like that when you can be there. So, I believe this, the school is to be reinvented and we can reinvent that just by putting an internet connection and bringing you know, a dozen of computers and putting them in contact maybe with you guys. So people who are connected and you will learn from them and they will learn. So it's an exchange, it's not a school with only one way, it's a double way school. So that's the fifth project of uh, Uda So to conclude now, we have, you have that which is your resources, your, where you still live. And uh, that's the uh, Udalo coast. That's a river when you go up to La Tag, you have plenty of extremely clean water, wonderful water. That's the beach also. That's uh, some lakes on, on the way to, to, uh, to La Tag. So we have to choose to, between this world and, and keep those people are totally independent food-wise, and they are in a total autonomy. So we can choose our way now to, to industrialize our uh, food productions and, and uh, merchandise it, 
or and get it through that. But that has a cost. It's always the cheap things that we buy there always end up here. No question about it, you know. And that will happen but potentially to uh, to uh, to Udalo. And that's what we try to avoid. Because necessarily it will end up and we know that it's, it's not fiction. I didn't make make up these uh, images. They are realities. That will happen, or we can choose to uh, operate differently. So that's a project uh, I'm leading, and I believe uh, we are really in between those two worlds now, and the choice is yours. I, I believe it's your generation choice. So uh, that's it for now.